it's time to take a look at some specific examples of ionics and covalence. So let's jump right on in. Take a look down here. All right, so check it out. Over here on the left, these right here, let's give you a close-up look at each of these. These are all the ionic compounds, okay? And then if you compare that to our covalent compounds over here on the right, you can actually very easily see that there's really no distinguishing uh, marks between them. Uh, the ionics and the covalents kind of look the same, especially when you take a look at this one as compared to this one. They're, it's all just white crystals or different colored crystals or different chunks. So a physical description of a substance really doesn't do you much good when you're trying to identify something as ionic or covalent. So let's take a look at some properties that are helpful. Check it out. All right, so what I've got is each of those same six compounds dissolved in water, and we're gonna be checking the solubility. So these right here are over on, the, on this side, these are all the ionic compounds. So you can see that one is soluble, right? This one, also soluble. And this one right here, also soluble. Over on the other side, these are the covalent compounds, and as you can see, that one is not soluble. And this one, it's a little more difficult to see, but it's floating at the top right here, also insoluble. And this one, actually of these three, is the only one that is soluble. So as a general trend, the ionic compounds are more soluble in water than the covalent compounds. Now, yes, I do realize that there are exceptions to the rule. There are some ionics that don't dissolve in water, and there are some covalents that do dissolve in water. Um, but consider this just kind of a little preview or a teaser trailer, if you will, of stuff that's about to come up in the second semester. But just overall, the general trend is ionics are soluble, whereas uh, the covalents usually are not. All right, let's go on to the next, uh, next property. All right, so the next property we're gonna look at is the melting point, and for that I have grabbed our trusty safety data sheets here, which lists all of those physical properties on there. Now, instead of just reading it off to you for all six of them, what I'll do is I'll just post them like so. And you can very easily see that the ionic compounds generally have a higher melting point than the covalent compounds. Now, again, there are some exceptions to the rule, but overall, ionics are te or tend to have higher melting points than the covalent compounds do. And last but not least on our list of properties is electrical conductivity, which for our purposes, it's a lot easier to see if the lights are turned off. Now, through the magic of editing, I'm gonna take you through these one at a time. So this is an ionic compound called potassium iodide, and you can clearly see the lights are coming on, so this does conduct electricity. This is magnesium chloride, also, an ionic compound and it conducts electricity. Here is another ionic compound called copper 2 nitrate. Also clearly conducts electricity. But what about the covalent compounds? So this first one here is something called p-dichlorobenzene which is used in mothballs and you can see that this one doesn't conduct electricity. Sugar or sucrose also does not conduct electricity and wax also does not conduct electricity. So what's the deal? Ionic compounds conduct electricity, but covalents do not. Why? Because ionic compounds are made of ions, and ions are needed to conduct electricity. These covalent compounds here don't split into ions, therefore they don't conduct. And there you have it, a quick little foray into the world of ionic and covalent compounds.